I am on a quest. I want to find out how to make software and hardware perform at their peak. I want to know how to make applications faster and more efficient. And while I'm at it, I want to have a little fun. Don't think I can do it? Just watch me. I'm Scott Moore, and this is the Performance Tour. Hey everybody, I'm Scott Moore and it's time for another exciting adventure of the Performance Tour. Thank you for being with us today. Shifting observability left. You know, observability has become the new APM, but many people only think of it in production environments. We need to shift that left the same way that we do in performance testing. That's going to be our topic today. But before we get into that, have you been to one of our Performance Tour Live events? We've had several throughout 2023, and I want to give a special shout out to my friends in Chicago, Illinois. My friends Lee Barnes and Forte Group were the sponsors of this meetup, and we had a great time answering a lot of questions and discussing performance engineering with the people there. Check it out. Now, on to our topic of shifting observability left. In 2023, in Dynatrace Perform, one of my friends, Michael Kobush, presented at a speaker session there. And unfortunately, I didn't make it because I got snowed in in Albuquerque, New Mexico, of all places. It won't happen again. But I did catch up with Michael in Kansas City this past summer to talk about some of the things he spoke on and he asked me a couple of questions too. So I wanted you to see this conversation because we get into some really good topics I think you'll enjoy on today's episode. Michael, yeah, welcome to the performance hey, tour. Thanks for having me. <laughs> a little bit hectic getting this all set up today, but thank you for being with us yeah. on such short notice. Excited. I was really disappointed in earlier this year because I got snowed out of Dynatrace Perform. Yeah. I was actually on the way, and you know, I travel everywhere by, by car, but we made it to Kansas City today. Here you are. And thank you so much for being with us. I watched your presentation, and one of the things I think is very important to be talking about today is that, that whole shift left dialogue that we always talk about, but I don't see as many people doing it as talking about it. And I think you're a person who's actually done it. Right? I have done it, yeah. So, Why don't you introduce yourself and talk about who you are a little bit so that they know and that's what I want to talk about today. Sure. Well, my name is Mike Kobush. I'm a senior performance engineer. I've been doing performance engineering for probably 15 years. I'm not technical by background. I have a degree in biology and a minor in chemistry. So everything that I have done in this performance engineering career, I've had to learn through mentors like yourself. So performance analysis didn't come naturally for me. I mean, it's still difficult and takes a lot of time. Um, so that's just like where I'm at in my career and now I'm wanting to shift left and I want to automate performance analysis, right? Because I don't like spending four or five hours looking through all the data, trying to piece it together because one day the data says something, the next day it says something else and you're like, how does that correlate, right? So a lot of times it's kind of hard to just go through all the data and make sure that it matches and doesn't match and why it why it does all that. So people people think shift left and they go, well, in order to do that, we have to be a DevOps shop and we have to be all DevOps. And so and one of the things I've heard you say is, you don't have to be DevOps to DevOps. You don't have to be DevOps to DevOps. That's right, exactly. We're not a DevOps world where I work, um, but I'm moving towards that myself, right? Using SLIs. And I think establishing SLIs within your application is like, majorly important because without it, how do you know if your application is passing? How do you know if it's failing? If you establish some sort of SLI metric that says, this is our threshold, it's gonna fail if we don't hit it, it's gonna pass if we do, that's super important, right? Especially 
in the performance world where things can get chaotic. I always say like performance engineering is like being a meteorologist, right? You have all these computer models, all this data to predict what's gonna happen when it goes to production. But when it gets out in the real world, it could do anything, right? So, I mean, we, we're pretty certain what's gonna happen, but there's glitches, things go down. Yeah, so performance engineering is kind of a, a different niche of engineer. I totally agree. And I know one of the things you're a big proponent of is what we used to call APM is now observability. We need to use the observability tools and platforms not only to monitor production, but we need to put them, we need to shift that left too. And you've kind of built sort of a machine that does that where you're at. Can you just kind of describe kind of, and we'll put a graphic on the screen here for everybody uh, in production, but talk about the machine sort of you built that has that whole pipeline where you're using observability and load testing together in pre Yeah, so I'm pretty excited about what I've been able to accomplish with the help of Dynatrace and other folks along my career. So what I've done is I've taken our load testing scripts, I've put them in a pipeline, in the GitLab pipeline. So now I can really shift left in development. Now I can run those. What I do is I have my pipeline kick off every night after the devs are done, pushing code in and out and making changes. At night, I'll run my development scripts, right? That will go through its process. And then with the help of Dynatrace, I can automate my performance analysis through SLIs and SLOs. When the scripts are done, Dynatrace picks up all that data, scores my test run, gives me a nice heat map, right? and then spits my result out into Slack or Teams. So when I'm sitting on the couch in the evening or I'm cooking dinner, I can look at my phone and say, okay, this test scored a 98. Well, I'm good to go for tomorrow, right? And I can do that with 50, 60, 70, 80 tests. So now I can really shift left and start testing everything in dev. And I know exactly when I go in the morning, do I need to research something? Did a dev make a mistake or break something within our application that I need to say, hey, yesterday you did something, I noticed it when we're running our pipeline, and we can make that fix. So now when things go to QA, my QA testing is gonna be a lot faster because I know what's happened in dev, so I'm pretty sure I know what's gonna happen in QA, and I'm gonna know what's gonna happen in production. Okay, so what you just described to me sounds like this well-oiled machine. Uh, how long does it take to get through this process, and how long does it take to analyze the information then versus now. So then before shifting left and using cloud automation and captain, you know, as performance engineers, it could take a long time to analyze the data. I mean, it depends on how much data that you have. It could take you three, four, five hours to go through data. Then you've got to write a nice little report, give it to the dev teams or the architects or whatever, right? Um, but now with cloud automation, you can run your test and in 20 seconds, you can have your performance analysis done, scored through SLIs, and have that information back. And you can give that information to your teams and they know like our scores are from 100 to 90, that's passing, 89 to 70 is a warning, anything below 70 is a failing. So now we, what Cloud Automation and Captain does, it builds this nice heat map of all your SLIs. And you can see green, reds, and yellows in this nice heat map. And I can give you a score and say, your scores were 95 today. Good job, let's keep moving on, right? And I've asked this question to a couple people. I said, how often do you need to analyze this data? Because as a performance engineer, I feel like I need to always analyze, right? I need to always be analyzing. But they said, trust your SLIs. If you trust your SLIs and you've got your score, you're good. So if you have well-crafted SLIs that you can trust, Take that information, give it to your team. So you've got a 95, let's move on and let's keep developing. Now you can do things faster, right? So it sounds like you get the first notification of this score, I call it a report card score, yep. uh, from maybe Slack. Yep. Oh, okay, we passed or we failed. The next place you might go is in Captain or some type of dashboard. Yeah, right. But if you need to dive deeper than that, where do you go from there? So I have the luxury of having an APM tool, uh, Dynatrace, and everything's in Dynatrace. So I can go in there and I can deep dive into the applications, into my test runs even, and look at everything from CPU to memory to database 
um, thread counts network, right? So that's where I go and I get all my information. Then I can give that to the dev teams and say, here's where I see we went wrong versus yesterday's run. Let's try to fix this. Or is this okay? Can we move forward? And it's not a report. It's not some final report from after some project or test. It's it's always there. It's information that's live right. and it's available. Yep. And you, but you said these metrics like SLIs might be transaction times, might be an SLI. Yep. What makes them trustworthy? What makes our trust? SLI is trustworthy? That's a, that's a good question. Well, I think what I did is I did a lot of testing before this and I really got to know my applications. And from there, from all the testing that I've done, looking at all the data over hundreds of test runs, I think I have my SLIs pretty narrowed in to where my application should be. So it's not a quick process to get this set up, but once you get it set up, you're golden, right? Because now things really start to pick up the pace and you can do analysis really quick and it's really nice. So you're you're really you're really giving me a good pitch here. Yeah, you right. got me almost hook line oh, sinker, man, okay? I'm, I'm fired up, I'm uh, in. What about script maintenance? Okay, we got these scripts that are running in this pipeline. How big of a deal is script maintenance and how lengthy of a process is it is it is to keep them maintained versus Exactly. So for me, script maintenance isn't really a huge deal because we're not putting in a lot of new features all the time. I would say probably maybe once every two months, we've got to go in and maintain three or four scripts. So for me, script maintenance is not too huge. And it's really good because when you're shifting left and you're testing every day, blah, 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 you can keep up on that, right? So right. expiring passwords is probably my biggest issue. When yeah, password nice. expires, then you've missed a day of testing, you're like, oh man, I've missed that. The real kicker is the GitLab pipelines failing for whatever reason, right? So somebody asked me, I don't know, I think it was five or six months ago. So how long does your GitLab pipeline fail? I mean, how, how many times does it fail? I was like, well, I don't, I don't know. I've really never thought about it. But once I started thinking about it, it fails probably 15 to 20% of the time. So there are some days that I'm gonna miss some data and that, that could hurt because maybe that, that deployment makes it up to QA. QA is crazy. Now I've got to spend more time. But compared to the testing you were able to get before, right. is this so much more testing done? Oh, so much more You've testing. gained so much more ground. So I think there's a lot of companies out there that don't do performance testing because of the time it takes to analyze and the time it takes to run, run run these scripts, right? But with this automated way of doing things, my scripts can run every day. I don't have to kick them off. I don't touch a button, right? I have it scheduled to go at a certain time every night. Everything's automatically analyzed. I just look at my phone at my Slack and say, yep, I'm good to go. So where would be the next level for you? Would it be you wake up in the morning and AI comes out and says, I found all the problems and I fixed it for you too, Michael. Have a great day. That is the next <laughs> level. Man, I always think about that. Like if I just had, a, if I could just push a button and it made everything run like it should at the SLIs that I put down, that would be the next level. Is that coming soon? Probably not. Are we getting closer to that though? I think so. I mean, with the APM tools that we have, I think with the data that we have, and the way that we can just like auto scale our servers and, you know, scale up, scale down. I think those days are coming to where I can just hit a button and say, I want it to run this fast. And it's gonna do that. It's pretty awesome. We'll have to, we'll have to see. So I have a question for you. This is a first. <laughs> so I'm shifting left in dev, right? Dev is always volatile. It can be up, it can be down, code's moving in, code's moving out. Do I want to put a lot of load in dev? Do I want to put a little load in dev? So I've listened to a lot of your performance tour, and I think you have this um, saying, if it doesn't work for one, it's not going to work for all. So what I do is I put a very small load in dev, maybe even as low as one user sometimes, up to five. And I want to, so what I'm doing is I'm testing code, right? I'm testing my response times. I don't really care about infrastructure in dev because dev's not going to scale all the time. What are your thoughts on how many users we should have shifting left in a dev environment? Well, you know, 
the environment itself is the bane of everybody's existence, as you know. And I would say more than 60% of the clients I work at, that's a problem they still haven't figured out. They haven't cracked that nut. And they're like, okay, but if I really size the environment the way it's supposed to be, or if we're cloud native, it makes it much easier. We just throw some machines out there and we test it against it. But uh, to your question, when you start with one, if it doesn't pass, you already know it's a fail, start working on it there. That's the best shift left you can do. And if you have the observability metrics, okay, and we know how much it's costing us, how much should you go to? We used to have this thing um, back in the day when I taught the class of how, how much further you go past that. It's, then it's like a test of the test. When you run multiple virtual users, are you stepping on each other's toes? Are you using the right data? Are you not, you know, are, is your, your randomization good? Are you, are you caching when you shouldn't be caching? Um, those type of things are answered at that five to 10 level. What, I, what we then have is this run called the top time transaction run. And that is just enough load. We used to say, if your goal was the 100%, 1,000 users, up to 20% of that. And that's just enough to see, A, did you bite off more than you could chew? Are you, are you really gonna fail at 20%? Or are you going to actually start seeing patterns emerge from that without killing, totally killing the system. So I would say pick an amount that's small enough where you know you're not gonna blast everything, but you will see the patterns emerge. And when you see the patterns emerging, you can start taking action. It may not be at one, it may not be at 10, but it's usually at that around 20% level. That's where I go. Now, if I can reach that and I see what the pattern's gonna be, if it's not bad enough to make any adjustments, that's when we start ramping up to that full 100% load of what, whatever we think it should be. But remember, it's all, within that constrained environment. All right, well, Does that answer your question? Yep. Come find me at Perform, and then we'll see how my load has increased in our dev environment, and we can talk about that. Looking then. forward to yep. it. Thanks for being on the show today, hey, Mike. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. And we'll see you on the road. I wanna thank Michael for sitting down with me and going over how he solves that problem of continuous performance and shifting reservability left, and using Dynatrace. Speaking of Dynatrace, did you know that Tricentis, our sponsor of the show, the makers of Neoload, have a bi-directional monitoring with Dynatrace so that you can see what's happening in Dynatrace as you run your test in Neoload and vice versa. You can use Dynatrace to see all the monitoring that you need to in Neoload. It's a really cool integration. Will you be at Dynatrace Perform 2024 in Las Vegas? Tricentis will be there. Make sure you stop by their booth and ask them about this integration and tell them Scott Moore sent you. For this episode of the Performance Tour, I'm Scott Moore. Thank you for watching. I'll see you on the road.